today to celebrate the fact that these beautiful animals that were destined to go to slaughter are gonna live out their lives peacefully at a sanctuary. I'm gonna talk about the impact eating animals has on our health and on the animals themselves. Sometimes we're just not aware of the profound implications and consequences of our food choices. And we do things like eating animals and animal products without even thinking or considering what even works for our bodies or for our world. There's a lot of very intelligent and thoughtful and kind and compassionate and otherwise educated people who believe that eating animals and animal products is something that we must do in order to maintain our health and our vitality. When in reality, we have seen that the diet that provides the most optimum nutrition and health is a plant-based vegan diet, where we get all of our nutrients from plant-based foods like vegetables, fruits, grains, legumes, nuts, and seeds. But people worry a lot about protein specifically. So I wanted to talk today a little bit more about what protein is and about the implications specifically about eating animal protein. First, it's important to know that protein is abundant both in plant foods as well as in animal foods. Protein is abundant in meat, fish, dairy, and eggs as well as in vegetables, grains, legumes, nuts and seeds, etc. Proteins, does anybody know what proteins are? <laughs> no? <laughs> proteins are simply chains of organic compounds called amino acids, which are joined together by peptide bonds. Proteins are simply chains of amino acids. The term Essential amino acid refers to nine amino acids that our bodies do not synthesize and we therefore need to get in food. But with few exceptions, like for example, gelatin, gelatin, which is actually an animal protein, with few exceptions like gelatin, most protein found in both animals and plant foods are complete protein, meaning they contain all of the essential amino acids our bodies require. The fact that plants have protein is for some reason not always well known. But just as an example, according to the USDA, broccoli has more protein per calorie than beef. When comparing beef patties with raw broccoli, we'll see that broccoli has about 15%, more protein per calorie than beef. See, when, when we eat protein, <laughs> woohoo, when we eat protein, either if we eat the beef patty or if we eat the broccoli, it's not like the protein that we eat goes straight to our muscles or straight to our enzymes and become, you know, the functions in our body straight like that. What happens is we synthesize protein according to our needs. If we are going to synthesize muscle, if we're going to synthesize an enzyme, our body could not care less whether the given amino acids that we're using came from a plant or from an animal because it's the same thing, it's, it's identical. When we're gonna synthesize a protein, we have the protein recipe in our cells, in our DNA, and then we build our own protein. And for all of those functions, our body does not care if we got it from a plant or from an animal, the amino acids that we're using. However, having said that, eating protein from animals can be problematic for several reasons with regards to our health. One of the aspects of animal protein which is problematic for our health is the fact that it contains a higher amount of essential amino acids. Now, I've, as I have said already, plants also have the essential amino acids, but the proportion and the concentration is less than that in animal protein. 
this increased concentration that we see in, in animal foods is a disadvantage and not an advantage from a medical perspective. It's a disadvantage because our body responds to this amino acid overload that we get when we eat plants, when we eat animals, by fabricating more of a hormone called IGF-1, which stands for insulin-like growth factor one. And this hormone, as the name implies, stimulates cell proliferation, both in healthy cells or perhaps in not so healthy cells that we would have been better off if it was their turn to die. So, as you can imagine, having higher levels of a hormone constantly, this telling ourselves to proliferate has been associated with many kinds of cancer and with more malignant and aggressive kinds of cancer because cancer is all about cell proliferation. So obviously it's not the only risk factor for cancer. Uh, however, it's one that is well understood and it is significant and it is easily avoidable, so we should not ignore it. Another aspect of animal protein that is problematic for our health is the fact that it is usually packaged with cholesterol. Now, our body synthesizes cholesterol for all of our bodily functions, for all of our cellular functions, and we do not need to get it from an external source. But we eat things like chicken and turkey, thinking that because they are white meats or because they are so-called lean meats, or thinking that if we eat them baked or boiled in a soup or grill that they don't, that they're a low-fat meal. When in reality, the animal flesh itself already has a very high content of cholesterol, which our body did not require, and which ends up getting burrowed in, our, in, in the lining of our arteries and causing plagues of cholesterol, causing atherosclerosis or cardiovascular disease. Actually, cardiovascular disease is the number one killer in this country. And studies show that it is ubiquitous since very early in our lives. One of many studies that have looked into this was actually a military study where they took 300 soldiers that had been killed in the battlefield, average age of 22, and they did autopsies of their bodies. And they found that these soldiers, that 77% of them already had visible plagues of cholesterol in the arteries that supply the heart. And these were, these were active soldiers in military life. These were not couch potatoes. So as you can see, if I am a person who's eating a Western diet filled with animals, filled with cholesterol, if I were to die today, even if I am athletic and lean, and they did an autopsy of my body, they would likely find vessels sickened with atherosclerosis. Now, the only source of cholesterol in the world is animals and animal products. And I, I'm not saying because of that that we should go out and have some french fries and stuff ourselves with oils. I'm not saying that at all. Because if we do that, you know, that also can cause uh, inflammation in our arteries, and then we're also going to end up probably synthesizing more cholesterol, which is not going to be good for us at all. But the, the only source of cholesterol, as in the form of cholesterol in the world, is in animal products, and that's a very problematic aspect of animal protein uh, when it comes to our health. Another aspect of animal protein that is problematic for our health is the fact that it has a higher proportion of sulfur-containing amino acids. Now, our body metabolizes these amino acids and produces sulfuric acid, and a diet high in animal protein results in us having higher amounts of acidity and acidosis in our body. Now, our body compensates for this acidity through several mechanisms. One of them is excreting hydrogen ions through our kidneys, but another mechanism that our body utilizes is it leaches calcium from our bones, 
and it utilizes that calcium to buffer the acid that we produced from, the, from metabolizing the protein in our diet. If it's something that we're eating for one week, for one month, it's not gonna obviously um, have too much effect on our bones. But if it's a diet that we're following for several years, it can definitely weaken bone. And we have seen that the people and the cultures in the studies that have the highest amount of animal protein in their diet have had increased incidence of many kinds of fractures. And this association holds true for protein in the liquid form of milk because milk is liquefied animal protein. And we have seen that the people who drink the highest amount of milk has been associated with an increased risk of fractures, including hip fractures, which is really sad. It's really a shame that many of us at some point thought that calcium is something that is obtained exclusively from dairy products and that for, some re for that specific reason we need to consume them. When in reality, calcium is a mineral that is obtained in a wide array of plant-based um, foods like uh, leafy greens and many kinds of beans and seeds without all of the negative associations that are associated with dairy. To start off, Milk is a condensation of all of the problems that a cow was exposed to. All of the antibiotics, all of the hormones, even the pesticides in her feed. But even if the milk was completely pure and organic, milk itself has been associated with a, with a wide array of increased risk of many pathologies from, from oncologic pathologies like um, prostate cancer and many hormone-related cancer to immune-related pathologies like multiple sclerosis and type 1 diabetes. You know, to me, the fact that um, dairy products, that milk has uh, all of these negative associations comes as no surprise because in reality, when you think about it, animals produce milk specifically for their calves to grow them to grow them as quickly and as efficiently as possible. And they are all different amongst themselves in the level of protein, carbohydrates, fat, minerals, vitamins, hormones. They are all different amongst themselves and they're all different than human's milk. The milk of a cow, of a pig, of a, of a porcupine, of a rat, they're all different among themselves and they're all different uh, than our milk. And we have uh, no business drinking the milk of a different species or eating the processed product of a milk of a different species. And now lastly, to conclude the health section, I want to point something out about fish. Okay. I want to point out, first of all, that fish, fishes are animals too. They are animals. They are not um, swimming vegetables with eyes, they are animals, and as such, they are animal protein, and they have the same associations and complications that I have already discussed, including the fact about cholesterol, because many fish have a large, uh, derive a lot of their calories from saturated fat and cholesterol. But fish are additionally frequently contaminated, um, for example, with mercury, which can cross the placenta barrier and cause neurologic problems in unborn, f in unborn babies. So as you can see, eating animals and animal products are a very poor choice when it comes to our health. But I want to switch gears a little bit here and talk a little bit about the animals. See, no matter how devastating the effects of eating animals and animal products are on our health. And no matter how devastating the effect of raising livestock for our consumption is on the environment, which is it's extremely devastating, but considering all of that, in my opinion, the, the 
the creatures who suffer our food choices the worst are actually, obviously, the animals themselves. And on this occasion, I would like to share with you an experience, a terrible experience that I had about two years ago when visiting a slaughterhouse. I was trying to compile all of the health, environmental, and ethic uh, implications of eating animal products on a, on a resource. And I was working on that, and I told a friend of mine who had a contact of his who was a general manager at a slaughterhouse. And I asked him if it would be possible for me to go there and, and do a little bit of filming, take a little bit of footage. And to my surprise, uh, the answer was yes, with several conditions. And um, I can't disclose the location or the name or things like that, but I was allowed to go there to this facility. Fortunately for you people, I was told I wouldn't have a projector here, so you don't have to see any of the horrible things that I, that I saw and that I filmed. But I want to share with you um, just some of the things that stood out to me. Speaking specifically about the moment of slaughter, I found that, not surprisingly, that, that these animals, when they were supposed to be killed before being dismembered and slaughtered, these animals were fighting for their lives. They were jerking around like crazy. They were moving violently. And so when they were supposed to be killed prior to being dismembered and, and slaughtered, they were frequently merely injured or weakened. And they went through the slaughter process completely awake and alert and feeling everything. Even, even if they hit the central nervous system, as a physician, I know that that is not a guarantee for an instant death or even a death at all from that particular lesion. I want you all to remember there was a Democratic Congresswoman whose, whose husband actually, I think, they live in this area because her husband is an astronaut for NASA, Gabrielle Giffords. She's a Democratic Congresswoman, and she was giving a talk in, in uh, early 2011, I think in Arizona, and she, somebody shot her in the head, and she had a bullet go through her skull and through her brain, and it exited the other side of her head, so it went absolutely, completely th <coughs> through her head. Now, she fortunately did not have an instant death at all. Actually, she was treated here in the Houston Medical Center and she recovered wonderfully. And she can talk and she, and she moves. And if you would see her today, you would never even know that she had a bullet go through her head. But back to, back to the slaughterhouse, the point I was making. So many of these animals, because they're nervous, because the workers are in a hurry, they're not even hit in a strategic location. And even if they did, that's not a guarantee for an instant death. But for example, the cows, speaking first about the cows, what I saw is that many of them had the bolt go not even in the head, but lower down like towards the neck. And so it would injure a part of their nervous system and they would be weakened and they would fall to the floor, the cows, but they were not dead at all or even close to being unconscious. They were not unconscious or anything that comes close to that. They were alive. They were still moving their, their legs. They were still moving the, with their neck. They were still moving it around. They were looking around in horror. Their eyes were this big and they knew exactly what was going on. And so after they would fall to the floor, a worker would come up and he would put a shackle on the hind leg of a cow. He would put a shackle and then a machine would lift the cow slowly so that the cow was suspended by, uh, by her hind leg. And then the worker would get like on a platform to be at the same level of the cow. And he would get close to the cow. Here is the cow with still the other legs kicking, trying to free herself. And the worker would come and first he would cut off the legs of the cow from the knee down. So he cut off the three legs, except for the one that where, um, where the cow was hanging from. 
he cut off the three legs, and the three legs fell to the ground. And then the worker came close to the cow, and he would lift the tail of the cow, and then from the very tip of the tail, he made a vertical incision in the skin. I don't know how superficial or deep, but a vertical incision and put the sharp object down. And then he pulled the skin of the cow. He pulled the skin of the cow down, all the way down. And then the skin of the own cow was hanging to the sides, like to, to either side of the head. So the cow was hanging with her own skin hanging on both sides of the head. So the cow couldn't even see anything anymore because all she had to see was her own skin on both sides and then, and then her legs on the floor. And then the worker came down from the platform and he made an incision in the neck of the cow and blood came gushing out. And then the cow started to choke on her own blood because every time she breathed, she would breathe her own blood. So then eventually, from the cow choking on her own blood and being uh, exsanguinated, she finally died a very slow and agonizing death. So as you can see, the horror that these animals go through are nothing like anything we can even imagine. And that doesn't even include what they go through prior to the moment of slaughter being branded with hot metals, being dehorned, maybe sustaining fractures in transportation, uh, having their calves taken from them. I still remember to this day the pleading eyes on, their cow, uh, on the cows' um, faces, and they still haunt me. One in particular I want to share with you before moving on. Um, so I went to this facility two days. The first day I went to the holding areas not to the actual slaughterhouse. The first day they just took me to where they would put the animals from the farms, um, about keep them about a week or so before it was their turn to be slaughtered. And so when we went to the holding areas, first of all, I saw that somehow all of these animals knew exactly what was going on to some level. Because the moment we would start walking there and talking, the moment they heard humans talking, the cows would start backing up, even like tripping on each other, just to get as, as far away from the humans as they could. And I don't think that's normal. So I think that on some level, they knew that something you know, really bad was going to happen to them. I, I think that's my impression. But after we finished visiting the facility, some of, it, some of the cows were housed in groups, some of the, some of the cows were um, individually, were, were like uh, held individually. But when we finished, there was one cow that was in a place, you know, held individually. And this was a white, beautiful cow. And she looked so nervous that I asked the person who was showing me around if we could stay here. We were already finished, if we could stay here. So we stayed a little bit and I pet the cow and I talked to her a little bit, and she finally calmed down after about 15 minutes. She looked just like in total um, terror. She, she was very afraid, and this was in the holding areas. And then they drove me back to the hotel, and the next day, they picked me up around 3 or 4 a.m., and we went to the slaughterhouse, and I saw the things that I already told you about. But then it came the turn of this white cow to get slaughtered. And what made it so much worse was this white cow, instead of fighting like the other cows, because see, the other cows, they would even get on their hind legs. I didn't even know cows could do that, like horses. Like horses, they would do that. And they were kicking and screaming and, uh, you know, just a horrible, horrible scene. But this white cow, instead of resisting, she just came up straight to the place where she had to position herself so that they would kill her. And she just came straight to me, and she was just straightening her neck as much as she could to get as close to me as she could. And while the other workers were pushing her around, instead of pushback, she was just pleading, like she was just begging for me to help her. She wasn't even blinking. She was just staring at me. But of course, there was nothing that I could do. There was absolutely nothing that I could do except film her. 
And so it was a very, very difficult experience, and that's one of the things that motivated me to talk about, uh, to educate people on these matters. But so that was cows, and I also saw the slaughtering of pigs, so I want to talk uh, briefly about that. Um, first of all, with pigs, it is acceptable for the pig industry to castrate the hogs and to pull out their teeth and to cut their tail as if it was made out of carton or paper to cut their tail without any anesthetics. And then it's acceptable to have them in places confined so small that they cannot even turn around. Imagine if you were a large part of your life in something like a coffin where you couldn't even turn around. And then the day when you are finally allowed to leave the coffin is the day when you're going to get slaughtered. And what I saw at this facility was the pigs were very, very unmotivated, obviously, to walk to the slaughterhouse. So this was a, so there was like a square where they were gonna connect with, uh, where, where, it, where there was a door that connected to like a hallway where the pigs would come from the holding areas. And what I saw is that the pigs would start walking towards there and then they would stop and then they would lift the, the head, and I could see their, their snout or their nose moving around. They were just standing still, like smelling. And then I guess they smelled the blood and the fear, and they realized that they wanted nothing to do with it, and they would turn around. But at the other end of the hallway, a worker was there to motivate them to go into the slaughterhouse. And so he would grab, there were like uh, two railways. It was a gated uh, hallway from the holding areas. And he would grab the railways and lift his two feet and kick him with his two feet. And then he would hit them with a metal rod so hard that eventually the, the pigs were so afraid of the person on the other end of the hallway that they were motivated enough to walk to their own deaths. And so then they had them in, uh, they, they got in the area, they closed the metal door behind them, and they stunned them in front of each other, you know, one by one. They stunned them briefly, and then they, hang, they also hang them by their back, um, by their back um, leg, and then they also cut their throat. And many of them, this is all done very quickly and kind of in a hurry, and many of them were still alive when they go through the final process where they dunk them in scalding hot water to remove their hair and soften the skin. And that is at that point when they finally die. And so I, I didn't witness the slaughtering of chickens, but I'm going to talk lastly just briefly about that um, because it's important that we cover it because chickens are arguably the most abused animal because uh, everybody eats large quantities of chicken. So let's talk uh, briefly about that. Uh, first of all, in nature, hens sometimes start communicating with the chicks before they even hatch, sometimes. But nowadays what happens is the fertilized eggs get put in an incubator and when they, are, when they hatch, they are separated in males and females. Now the male chicks are considered worthless to the industry because they don't lay eggs and they cannot be grown as quickly when given hormones as the females are. So the male chicks are disposed of when they are born. They put them by the thousands in these conveyor bands and when the conveyor band comes to an end, they get deposited sometimes into some grinding machines and they are ground up alive, and that is a um, legal and standard practice. They also put them sometimes in big plastic bags, the male chicks, and when the plastic bag is full, then they tie a knot to the plastic bag, and then at some point in the future, or at some, in some time, then the chicks eventually die. Eventually, I don't know when, but it's probably a very slow and agonizing death as well. And now the female chicks, the female chicks who are not ground up alive and who are not uh, put in a plastic bag to you know, die slowly, um, in my opinion, have it actually worse than the male chicks because they have a lifetime of suffering. The, first of all, they cut their beaks. They cut their beaks with a hot metal. And then 
they put them because they put they're in such crowded conditions that they go crazy and they they start pecking at each other. Just like if you know if they put twenty humans, you know, I'm sure in a in an elevator for for the large uh, amount of their lifetime, I'm sure there would be problems. Even if they put the twenty smartest humans in those conditions, I'm sure there would be problems. But um, they grow them so quickly and so unnaturally that many of them have health problems, including joint problems. And sometimes they die of thirst close to the water source just because they're unable to lift their bodies up and walk to the water and drink some water. So it's very, very terrible conditions in their lifetime. And when it's time for them to finally go to slaughter, they put them in crowded conditions in, in cages and boxes, and they transport them with no water or food sometimes in uh, extreme heat or cold. Sometimes these conditions are so bad that they die on the way to slaughter. But if they don't, then when they, go, when they get to the slaughterhouse, they hang them by their two legs, and then they go through some like circulating metal blades, kind of like going through a blender. So it's not necessarily going to produce a quick and instant death, but it's surely going to produce a lot of tissue damage and tissue lashing and, and bleeding. So again, with the chickens, many of them are still alive when they go through the final stage where they also get dunked in scalding hot water to remove their feathers. So, so as you can see, we are creating a hell-like condition for these animals. For these animals, um, this world that we're living in is, is hell on Earth. And the problem is we have absolutely no way of justifying this. We have absolutely no justification. And now I'm a physician, and I practice currently in the correctional system. I see patients both at a correctional facility, a closed correctional facility, and also at a forensic parole office. And I know this about the legal system. I know that if the, if the woman here with a black shirt, for whatever reason, does not like the man over there with the black shirt, and she decides for whatever reason that she wants to kill him and buys a gun and she kills him, then according to our legal system, she will be guilty of murder. But if she does not want to do her dirty work herself for whatever reason, and she decides to pay some money to the man who's beside her so that he does the dirty work, and he goes and kills the man in the black shirt. Well, the woman here in the black shirt, even if she did not commit the crime herself, according to our legal system, she will still be guilty of murder. Okay? And when it comes to animals, when it comes to animals, don't, don't get fooled by the, by the normalcy in our society, the fact that everybody's consuming them. Don't be fooled by the ubiquitousness because they seem to be absolutely in all of the foods and everywhere you go. Because, because notwithstanding the psychological difference, the obvious psychological difference, if I am ordering a chicken salad or some ribs or a pepperoni pizza or an egg omelet or some ice cream or a hot dog and a hamburger, then I am paying somebody to do my dirty work and I am just as morally responsible and I have the same amount of blood on my hands as the person who is grinding the cheeks or putting the knot on the plastic bag or skinning the cow and cutting her legs or dunking the pig and the hen in scalding hot water. So we really, really need to stop all of this animal and animal product consumption nonsense once and for all. 
And if you are not doing so already, I invite you to leave animals and animal products completely off of your plates forever for your own health, for your own survival, for the environment, and of course, for the animals themselves. And with that, I want to thank you all very much for your time and your attention. Thank you very much. <laughs>